described. Very quickly, obviously, uh, again, apologize. All of these are kind of topics that could take a month of meetings, but uh, with our mind, we're trying to move quickly. Uh, so before we kind of get into that, though, uh, I believe Jeff or somebody circulated the meetings, uh, the minutes from the last couple meetings. Um, so it, the, do I have a motion to uh, approve those uh, those minutes? So move, Steve. Great. Chris, do we have a second? I yes, second. So approved. Good. Um, all right. So now we can get into the substance. Um, or actually, uh, before we get into the substance of the uh, today's meeting, which will be a lot of retail licenses and the other license types, I think Jeff wanted to uh, take a minute or two to talk about um, some small cultivator uh, issues or things, kind of follow up from last call. Is that still, Jeff, do you still want to take a couple minutes right now? Yeah, in the interest of being brief, I'll keep it short. Um, but after, after the last couple meetings, thinking of how to split up this 400,000 square foot estimate of flowering canopy, um, under 904A, it sets a ceiling of 1,000 square feet, but it doesn't set a floor. So that seems like there's a lot of room to have some very small type licenses within that or the authority in that section. Um, I'm thinking of two. Uh, number one is a home grow permit, no more than 10 square feet, uh, no sales, and uh, no tax. So mainly the idea is that uh, somebody could set up a, a plant in their closet or backyard and not worry about getting seeds and pay a small fee for an annual permit. The second idea is a special license for farmer's market sales only for no more than 100 square feet. Um, that would be taxable at the point of sale and a limited, limited sales permission for farmer's market. Now how to regulate a cannabis farmer's market is another riddle, but uh, I believe Vermont can probably figure it out. But I just wanted to throw those out there that there's a lot of room to have really, really small licenses that can raise uh, small amounts of money that will add to the whole pot. So, so Jeff, for a, a home grower, are you talking about like allowing the home growers to essentially sell to either manufacturers or cultivators who then get that product tested, packaged, and enter into the legal market, similar to how it occurred in either California or Michigan uh, prior to the establishment of their uh, medical cannabis regulatory system, or, or are you just talking about allowance for personal home cultivation, which is already permitted in Vermont and has been before uh, this most recent law, which authorized commercial operations? Okay, well, thanks for clarifying that. Um, I wasn't aware that it's already happening, that the home grow is already happening. I was just thinking of a way to, to protect home growers from seizure, but if they're already protected from seizure, then uh, it's kind of a moot point. I was thinking of just yeah. way small amounts of money with permits. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I think there is, it's probably not a uh, conversation to have now, but it's a larger discussion. There is, um, there is merit to revisiting whether or not essentially the system that uh, Michigan had established uh, for about a year and a half, uh, which is allowed a stimulus, uh, existing caregivers to sell into the system, um, had some merit of discussion. But I don't think it is likely permissible under the in, under the structures of uh, of the current um, Vermont statute. Thanks, Andrew. And I'll also say, Jeff, I think you'll. Uh, I, I think we're on the same wavelength. Uh, in a few minutes, we're going to talk about some of our some of the ideas we had, we thought of for retail licenses, and one of them was to uh, try to find a way for for small farmers to to sell directly to consumers. So. Uh, we'll, I can hold your thoughts on that for maybe five minutes and then we'll, then we'll be popping back up. So, um, all right. So, and I, I, I think I just saw that Stephanie joined. So, uh, we have the full gang here. So, um, this is just uh, kind of our going forward, our next few meetings. Um, I kept these statutory uh, requirements in in case anyone wanted to look back at it, but we covered them last time. Uh, here's kind of the the specific statute uh, that we're we'll be looking at today. These are the license types that are, are out um, uh, in the statute. And then, um, as you'll notice, the board is required to tier retailer licenses uh, and has the authority to tier other types of licenses uh, should they see fit. So um, kind of what we want to talk about today are, are those decisions, like how, how uh, we should tier retail licenses and um, how, if at all, should we tear, tier other types of licenses. So um, again, as we get into it today, um, 
as, as with something I feel like I've, I've talked about on all the calls, like all of this is just slightly backwards um, because of the statutory requirement to get this report in on, on fees. Um, so today I think we want to talk about kind of the concepts of, um, of these license types, well, whereas like the details will probably uh, get kicked a little bit down the road. So we're trying to hopefully get some like agreement on, on concepts of, of things to explore, um, but uh, each one of these license types will have to be defined further in the regulations by the board. Um, I know that's probably things that this working group and uh, this subcommittee and other subcommittees are going to be talking about going forward, but for the purposes of getting ready for um, this initial report, we need to just kind of identify what those license types are in order so that we can uh, set a fee for them um, you know, for when, the, when they're actually awarded. So um, starting first and probably what will take up a, a good chunk of today's call is I wanted to talk about retail licenses. So, as I just mentioned, the board's required to tier the re retail licenses. Um, we've kind of thought up uh, a handful of concepts on, on how those retail licenses could be tiered. Um, there's obviously like uh, quite a, many different types of retail licenses that can be thought of or, or different ways to do this. What we were trying to do is make sure that we created concepts of licenses that would allow for access for, um, for, for smaller, uh, operators access uh, for, for farmers um, but while but also trying to um, you know ensure that there are uh, you know traditional storefronts available and that there's um, you know no licenses that kind of undercut other licenses or anything along those lines so what we're going to go through right now is kind of the, a, a handful of concepts that we thought up um, well I think would I think would be most helpful um, would be to to just kind of talk about them as concepts. Um, each one of these could have a lot of details, um, so I don't want to get too far down um, tangents on like how to exactly define it. But you know, everyone feel free to voice your, your thoughts or concerns on that. But um, I think the, the goal will be to identify concepts to recommend to the board. Um, but and then I guess one last caveat before we get into the substance is uh, the just wanted to say that these are all ideas um, and it is the board's uh, kind of final decision on this on whether they have uh, the authority to, to make all of these and, and set, the, set the rules on them. Um, some of these I think all can, would be considered tiers of retail licenses. Others might make an argument that uh, you know that that these are different license types. Um, so and we didn't do that uh, full legal analysis of kind of where these would fit. So, we're throwing out the concepts and, and what we think could fit, but um, you know, all of this is obviously subject to, to legal review by, by the board's council and, and others. So uh, diving into it, um, I guess the first tier and probably one that uh, I assume everybody will be on board, but uh, object, I guess, if you will, uh, would be the traditional storefront retailer. Um, that's what you see in, in uh, all, all the other states. And um, I don't, if anyone has any questions, I can explain what that means, but I, I think I'm sure everybody um, you know, gets the concept and, and understands, and I assume uh, everyone's on board with having uh, traditional storefront retailers uh, in Vermont. So um, I'll move on uh, to the next. And I guess for the fee purposes, again, we need to, and this is going to be the subject of next Monday's meeting, but we're going to talk a little bit about projected budget, and we have to try to aim to have fees cover costs if possible. Um, so that I think these out of the retailer licenses probably have the highest fees, um, you know, are, but again, we have to kind of look at the budgetary information, look at some of the information from other states and, and estimate what those fees are. But um, I think the rest of our options here for the most part would be aimed at uh, smaller operators and would, would have lower fees um, than these guys. So any, I'll stop for a second. Any, any thoughts or um, concerns on that? Well, I do understand your concept of, um, your, your storefront or your brick and mortar store, it, that is retail of finished product. Yes. yes. Okay. Retail of finished product. Uh, Yvonne? Sorry, I had to unmute. Um, definitely support the simple one, like having a proper storefront retailer. Um, as we look into the others, and I would say you almost have this in order of, you know, most traditional to least traditional. Um, I would want to know a lot from the other subcommittee that's covering security um, before we get into the less traditional 
retailer types. You know, I mean, it takes back down the middle, farmer retailer. I think that's one that a lot of Vermonters are probably very supportive of. Um, but before we authorize that, and I'm not at all against authorizing that, I would want to know what we're talking about when it comes to security, what regulation is going to be like, how are they going to look like for retailers, because I don't want to create uh, a security risk for a ton of Vermont farmers who now have, you know, they, they, they slightly adjust what was their maple syrup selling stand to also sell their cannabis, and we've got some, you know, potential, you know, real issues. Um, so I, I, I want to know a lot more about what the security subcommittee is doing. Um, and then I'd add in, um, as all these go, you know, there's a lot of parallels to the alcohol side of things. Um, and, in, you know, in Vermont law, we do have things like temporary sales for events. We don't have things like delivery. Um, there, there's certain kind of ways, but not really for the most part, um, other than the COVID exception. Um, but I, I would personally advocate that no matter what the answer to security, that some of the, the last two there, you know, as we get to the weirder side of things, less traditional side of things, I would advocate that those are not things we start with. I would want to see this market um, become established and a little more mature and have the opportunity for the board to work out any kinks and to figure out other parts that actually get going and, and leave those not unauthorized, just authorized for further consideration or you know tabled for year two or year three or for something along that front where you know I, I, I want to help avoid um, an, un, un, an accidental wild west. So the one model that we have is not, a, you know, tobacco or, or alcohol relative to um, delivery and or farmer retail is raw milk. Um, the state of Vermont regulates raw milk and you have to have a relationship with the farmer. There are specific um, uh, hazards claims associated with raw milk, not that that's applicable here or, or, or it could be, I mean, it could be similar, um, but they do allow for delivery and they do allow for on-farm sales and I think just recently they allowed for um, sales at farmers markets, um, but there's a fair bit of regulation and now that does not address the security issues, there's no one stealing raw milk in the state of Vermont, I believe, but, um, but there are some kind of like the framework for how it's regulated uh, that does exist and, and could, could, we could borrow a little bit from that. Um, thanks. Yeah, and I think, um, Devon, I think you, uh, you, you you did accurately crack the code of kind of how this order uh, was put together here. I think the, the first two are particularly not, not easy, but easier ones to, to fit into a traditional model. Um, the, the middle two are things that seem to have gotten public comments on it. It seems like things that um, seem to be very focused on trying to create the sort of license types that will work for folks in Vermont. Um, but then you highlighted the, the you know, real concerns of those are the two license types that we would need the most context about and understand how the, how the regulations are, are drafted. And that's probably something that we're not going to um, have full details for uh, before we have to ask for, for a fee. Um, I'm not actually sure where the, because you, you also highlighted the other issue, um, some of the concerns from uh, that those two license types would raise are subject matters of different subgroups uh, that I haven't been sitting on, so I'm not really sure where they are. And I think some of this will just have to be a back and forth because I don't know if they're considering security requirements of the farmer retailers because they're not looking at different license types and so um, some of it some of these things maybe the result here is you know we raise it um, say this would be something that we could support with appropriate um, definition and, and security requirements and, and then um, let that be something that the other subcommittee group uh, subcommittee you know reviews and, and fills out not to not to put things on what I'm sure is already a very yeah, and I'll I'll, I'll, I'll slightly uh, change what, what you're suggesting, Dan, is where I would have gone next, but uh, in a slightly different framework. I would say we have the ability to decide in this group what the fee structure will be for those potential types of licenses without the board necessarily authorizing those licenses to exist yet. So, you know, we can say if the board authorizes non-storefront delivery, if the board authorizes temporary sales for events, the fee structure will be this. but it's up to the board to decide when they're comfortable doing so. But, you know, I, I'd rather take it up to the board rather than over to a subcommittee. Um, but same concept of what you're saying. 
And then I would add one more fine point. Uh, this is part of the security part, but just another one that I don't personally feel up to date with yet, at least in our subcommittee, um, is I'd want to know uh, what uh, payment options are going to be for cannabis in Vermont. You know, obviously all cash is a disaster, and uh, federally it's very hard to get away from all cash, but I, I believe that there has been a lot of exploration in Vermont of potential state financial institutions. Um, not state chartered, not federally chartered. Uh, but I don't know any details around that. I want to know a lot about that too, because especially if we're talking about all cash, that makes me even more concerned about a smaller and less protected retailers. Yeah, sure. Uh, I completely agree on that. And, and hopefully, again, it's uh, not, it hasn't really been in our, our purview here. Um, but And so I'm sure the board knows a little bit more of where, where all that is. But I would hope that Vermont will have some. Uh, enough banking coverage so that a lot of these uh, transactions will not be cash. Um, and, you know, I think hopefully I speak for everyone on the call and hopefully at some point in the near future we have uh, some federal legal changes that, that uh, eliminate that issue uh, for, for good. But um, kind of, so I think I think we kind of have some, some good marching orders here and I think everything that you said made sense. So why don't we then uh, kind of approach these as um, these are concepts that we feel comfortable recommending uh, for the purposes of providing fees with the caveat that um, the board does not have to recommend any of these and that the board shall only recommend those if the security requirements and other requirements um, are, are adequate. I know that's not like a, a, a clean legal term, but I think we all uh, get the concept and, and, and I think the board will understand like kind of what we mean there is um, these are I think these all are options, or uh, I think these could all be options to help the, the Vermont market, but they have to be done right and they have to be done smartly. Um, and, and just where we are, we have to kind of make a call on whether we should recommend them before we know if they'll be done right and done smartly. But I think we can um, recommend them uh, with, uh, you know, conditional upon future regulations and, and further, uh, further analysis. But, does that make sense from a concept? And then we can kind of quickly run through these um, and see where I, I fully support that. And, and just to, to save you some, some breath in the future, I'll just remind us all that we're an advisory committee to the board. So anything that we recommend here is to up to the board's discussion. So, you know, we, we, we take everything we're going to solve and we trust their discussion. Excellent. Excellent. Thanks for, thanks for uh, putting it uh, so perfectly. Um, so, so we, we covered the traditional uh, storefront retailer. Uh, seeds and clones would be like a, a small retailer selling uh, seeds and clones to, to either home cultivators or, or um, uh, other cultivators. So, um, you know, I think that's a, a pretty easy one from a regulatory perspective to, to kind of um, to regulate. I mean, I guess everything's relative uh, in this world, everything's a little difficult to uh, to regulate. But compared to some of our, compared to the next two bullet points, that I feel like that's an easier one. So, uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, I have well, a short question. Actually, I just I don't know the answer. Is it possible that individuals would provide services of starting? Plan I know clones. I, I I guess the science behind the clone. But if someone were to say, "Here's my pack of seeds," or "You bought seeds," and you're starting a whole bunch of plants for somebody, I guess nursery is what I was thinking more so. But I guess, I guess that's lots in the clones as well, right? Like you're talking about all of that. Yeah. You start selling seed packets, selling clones. Yeah, that, that, was, that was where I thought the concept was. I don't, Andrew, if you, uh, or Jen, if either of you have different thoughts on it, but that's, that's what I envisioned. Um, okay. Didn't define it fully in the slide, but. Yeah, yeah, this is, is maybe more designed for um, sales to consumer, uh, but you know it may be possible that a cultivator uh, would buy these. Now, now, depending on how the seed sales tracking system works, probably the most likely for those cases because you couldn't buy seeds at retail and then just bring those, you know, seeds that are then no longer in the seed sales tracking system back into a cultivation facility. You typically end up with a cultivation to cultivation transfer. But again, I, I, I'm pretty sure that there needs to be a technical technical statutory change to enable that. Um, uh, you know, we spoke with some um, uh, stakeholders a while ago that, that um, I think mentioned that on one of the one of the calls. So 
Uh, James is taking note of that as far as something to, that we should probably look into. Um, because otherwise, I mean, a, a nursery license would obviously not be viable if you can't do a cultivation and cultivation, um, you know, inventory transfers of, of that type of commodity. In most cases, though, even those, those licenses that do have nurseries, like in California, I, I don't know how prevalent they've been. Most, um, most cultivators do their own in-house, um, you know, new introduction of, of cultivation genetics. This would be more so designed for retailers. I think that's actually an interesting one. I think that could be very, very Vermonty. Um, but you know, because we already have legal home cultivation, uh, I can imagine uh, a small but robust market of home cultivators who aren't necessarily the greenest of thumbs and would be thrilled to buy from a nursery that is, uh, you know, starting it for them. And if if that creates another small part of this economy, that could be a great, you know, corner to have. I have a question, Great. if you don't mind. This is James Pepper. You know, when we think about seeds and clones, and forgive my ignorance, but these are all kind of non-flowering, lower than 0.3% THC. So are they even within the Cannabis Board's jurisdiction? Um, I believe they would be. OK. Um, there's also there's a larger question that I've worked with on our, with our hemp team about um, whether or not essentially the seeds of marijuana plants that are a, will grow into above a 0.3% THC are hemp seeds. Um, and I think that the, the legal analysis that I've seen shows that they're not hemp seeds. Now, in may, most cases, that is how those are, you know, when you see seeds selling in uh, the European Union, that's typically how they get around that in a legal gray area, but I'm not a, uh, a lawyer and definitely not a European law lawyer. So in the state of Vermont, we have a labeling standard for hemp seed, and it has to be labeled that it's, you know, the THC production is, you know, less than the federal standard. So, so we, we actually cover that. Um, so we would consider, I mean, when you buy a pack of seeds, it's got to be truth in labeling. If you want a guarantee of some THC concentration and it's over and above a hemp concentration, it should be labeled as such as a consumer, but that's what I want to know. Um, so yeah, no, they're not hemp seeds. They would definitely, it's, I think it's within the purview of the, of the CCB. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, only that it's in, in the back of my mind for a while and just thanks for the clarification. Of course, and um, so th these next two are kind of the ones that are, uh, in response uh, to what we've heard from, from public comments that have been submitted online and just talking to folks in Vermont, like we were trying to figure out uh, licenses that would um, kind of accentuate uh, the Vermont culture and, and work with their geography and, and kind of culture. So uh, this limited location retail, and both of these probably have, could come up with catchier names, uh, not, in, not in marketing, but uh, but that we were thinking of uh, basically a, a, uh, a retail uh, counter or section of an existing um, storefront. Uh, this has been brought up a couple of times by people who um, are thinking of towns that are very small um, and may have some um, cannabis retail needs but can't support a full store. Um, so there could be different ways of designing, uh, you know, uh, designing uh, a, um, a a corner of a shop or a separate entrance to a shop or something that's in an existing store um, allowed to sell retail. Um, and you would obviously, this is one of the ones that's going to have a lot of um, interest in how it's defined. Um, you would want to obviously make sure that uh, this doesn't undercut traditional storefront retailers. Um, if you allow this to be lower fee and, and everywhere, um, no one's going to go through the the hassle of having the, the more um, uh, robust uh, license, but if you, but we're thinking if you could, you could probably limit this via, you know, maximum amount of sales, store, like inventory that can be held, things along those lines. Um, so uh, again, let's 
take a few seconds to talk about like the, the concept um, and if this is something that the board should explore further we think it could be a way to um, provide access to consumers who are located a little bit further away from some of the population centers or, or who uh, um, and also a way to help support some of the small general stores that um, could use a little boost in revenue um, but obviously there's quite a few uh, variables and questions about how to uh, to define it and to set those regulations. So, Devon? Uh, yeah, Dan, do you have, or maybe Andrew has in the model, um, guesstimate recommendations. Let's say that we end up saying we're going with all of these types and we, you know, we have the target canopy total size of the state we're projecting, yada, yada. Give a, a, a scale of what the recommended or what your first recommendations of the committee would be of the dollar amount per year or whatever else it is for these licenses. As far as how much revenue they would gain? No, like what's the per license cost to uh, a retailer? Oh, to, to, for the actual fee? Yeah. I, I don't have a recommendation on that yet. Um, and I think it would vary pretty significantly depending on the type of retail license. Sure. So, so I'll, 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 I'll that's even if my, my response to your question, Dan, is I'm not 100% sure we need limited location retailer in its own category if the board cracks traditional storefront retailer with enough flexibility of what counts as a traditional storefront retailer. But, you know, and that, for example, would be like, you know, here's the amount you're allowed to hold if your whole store only does this. Here's the amount you're allowed to hold if you're only a dedicated corner of a larger store, yada, yada, right? So you could eliminate an entire category here of license, potentially. But I qualify my entire comment with, I don't have a sense yet of the scale we're going to be recommending on fees. And so if we're going to be saying that it's $50,000 to be a storefront retailer a year, um, but it's $1,000 to be a limited location retailer, I totally understand the difference. Or if we're going to end up recommending that we're talking about a couple thousand dollars a year, more akin to alcohol licenses, then that's a little different, um, $100, et cetera. So, so I think a lot needs to tie into uh, how much we end up realizing we need to recognize from these fees. Yeah, and I think that's a, a great point and, and one that's um, probably been underlying our uh, kind of presentations without actually, uh, we probably should have been clear about that. We haven't like come up with our, our full recommendations on fees. I think we're going to aim to do that for, for uh, sometime next week because we're moving so quickly uh, through all of this stuff. But part of the reason why we put it as a tier here was to allow us to have different recommendations for fees. We weren't going to, I mean, there's a con we could have tiered all, I mean, we could probably, you know, scrap a lot of this, have the board do, um, have a very expansive definition and rules for, for retail and then tier the fees based on sales. Um, but we thought this was an easier way of, of setting up basically a traditional storefront at one fee statewide and then create lower fees for, um, you know, and then once the once the regulations and rules are set in, like these would have different limits. So um, I don't have a great answer to your question yet because we haven't started to grasp with what what that fee needs to be. And again, I think I said it in the first meeting. And sorry, set me up on one second. I just want to finish this thought before I lose it. Um, I think I said I mentioned in the first meeting, but the statute says uh, that uh, we need to try to come up with fees that will cover the cost of uh, of operation for the board. Um, you know, some like real quick, uh, like back of the envelope, um, or just the way we're looking at it, it's gonna be very, very difficult to do without having extremely high fees, um, I think. And again, as you mentioned, we're an advisory uh, board here and it's the, the board's final decision. I think one of the things that we might want to end up proposing is, um, you know, we'll put a couple of sets of recommendations on fees together, like here's what the fees would need to be if we do have to cover the, the board's full cost um, right away. Um, and then here's, you know, maybe slightly more reasonable fees um, where there's some tax revenue being kicked in. Uh, because I think there's just not going to be, a, it's, it's going to be hard for a state this size, uh, even with the, the board's lean budget, to, to cover those fees up front if we also want to make sure that we have enough accessible license type with low fees. Um, so um, I guess. All of this is kind of a, a pause for now while we run the numbers and, and try to get back some projections, which we'll be talking about with you guys uh, next week. Um, but um, for right now, I, 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 I think 
I'd like to, I'd recommend putting them in two different tiers just so that we have that flexibility to assign them different uh, license fees going forward. Great, uh, Stephanie and then, and then Tom. I think you mentioned this, um, but I, I feel like the limited location or limited square air, you know, saleable floor area is kind of what it is, right? <laughs> the limited saleable floor area um, here could just be nested under traditional storefront, you know? Like you could do it by um, saleable floor area, like just like you have a hundred square feet of floor area excluding stairways and closets or whatever, um, similar to a zoning tactic, and then, or you have 1,500 square feet or you have 2,000 square feet, and then you can tear it out that way. Um, but Yeah, I, I think some of this is the reason we, we thought there might need to be a different license type is because you would need to stand up the different security requirements. So for instance, like, you know, Vermont has a lot of very rural areas in which there's only a single or maybe a, a less than a handful of stores that cover the entire town, and it may not be viable to have a one of those three stores in the town be a cannabis uh, retailer. And so the thought then, is it possible to create a situation in which, for instance, you know, most of the store is open to all people, including those under the age of 21, and then there's a separate door and a separate section within that store that you need to be over 21 to enter. Okay. And so some, some of these are essentially setting it up, you know, for a further discussion with either the, uh, you know, the security subgroup or for the, um, uh, the, the board to consider as it pertains to differential security uh, regulations for these different lines. And just to add a fine point to that, Andrew, um, you'd also, logically, you'd want to say a limited location one can only sell up to a certain amount or some other certain cap so that, you know, if it is much cheaper to be that, you don't want to incentivize people that would have been storefront retailers to just be limited location retailers and, and find a way to put a coffee shop into just to, you know, to, to game it. So you'd want to say, if you want to really do the full shebang, you're a traditional storefront retailer, but here's a way to enable smaller towns to have the, the side counters, et cetera, too. Agreed. Yeah, I completely agree on that. Um, Tom? Yeah, sorry, just quickly, I know you got a lot to go through, Dan, but one issue to consider with a, with a limited sales uh, which is a great concept, I think, especially for the smaller towns. But um, when we're talking about buffer zones, uh, which I know is another subcommittee, but um, you're, you're likely going to run headlong into some of those restrictions because if, if you've got an existing store, it's likely not going to have to follow the 500,000 foot restrictions for a school, uh, you know, church, however you want to define it, or even you know, a lot of states have residences. Um, and so, when, yeah, it, it's just one more thing when you're talking about gaming it. Uh, it it's going to be it's going to be tough to distinguish between that and the traditional storefront. Yeah, um, we I, I I agree. I think that falls into kind of uh, Devon's point earlier, where um, I don't want to limit us here. Um, again, it's. We, we're not getting paid to make the tough calls that's on the board um, on kind of how they, but we just, this seems like it's a, we thought the concept was uh, valid enough to, to put forward. Um, if they, okay. but there's, there's quite a few, it's not an easy concept uh, right. for, for all of these reasons that would uh, work, but if it's something that's a, um, you know, if it's something that if any state was gonna try to adopt it, it seems like it fits. Um, with Vermont, it could be a win-win with both helping the some of the small uh, small town general stores and also helping um, helping uh, figure out a kind of a low cost entry to this market in, in uh, um, some of these towns where it's not going to be uh, economic uh, economically feasible to open a full uh, storefront retailer. So, um, yeah. Uh, sorry, Mark. I didn't hear uh, just was going to say, Dan. Uh, this is a familiar concept in the alcohol industry that you guys probably know. You probably modeled it like that. But uh, you know, the state of Virginia, like where I live, is, has a lot of rural areas. And that's pretty much how they service the, the rural areas, which is just a you know a, 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 a licensee who's uh, you know who can uh, stock a couple of shelves or, or whatever it is. So 
Not saying it's for, for poor Vermont, but you know, it's it's common. Yeah, we, uh, you know, we didn't can't take credit for the concept. We did we did lift it from uh, other people had the idea, and we knew that alcohol does it in some of the rural areas. So you know, we just copy other good ideas for the most part. Um, so. Uh, any other questions on on that? I do want to just keep moving because we have a lot to cover. Um, and I think so. I I guess objections. I think are we can recommend uh, recommend that the board explores this license type with all of the necessary caveats um, and conditions. Sounds good. Great. Uh, and then I feel like this is going to be the same. Uh, this is kind of the same same question. And this is the farmer retailer that would allow. Like limited products to be sold from from small cultivators uh, direct to consumer. Um, I, I, I think this might be something that some of the other uh, uh, <coughs> groups are looking, uh, subcommittees are looking at as well. But it it, it raises the same. It's it's uh, the concept is to help uh, Vermonters, and it raises the same question as, as the, the last license. So I, I imagine the discussion will sound similar. It's obviously different. Uh, details of how you how do you secure this and how do you limit the products? Because um, again, you don't want to um, you know totally cut out the storefront retailers, but uh, you know we're thinking envisioning some sort of like uh, flower and may, or maybe some you know some very limited production, like allowing uh, you know pre rolls or something along those lines. But again, a lot of this is um, do we feel comfortable with? That, uh, Recommending this as a as a concept um, with the the if the board can figure out how to how to make it work in practice sounds good uh, I see a, enough thumbs up um, and so again now we're kind of to the last the last two are are right are probably the uh, the trickiest ones these are these are license types that we see in other states um, but they are often different license types and uh, I think. Sivan's already uh, expressed his hesitancy, so I don't know if we want to run through quickly what they are. I think delivery has um, uh, is has both benefits and and some issues in, in Vermont. One, it's probably harder to operate a, a delivery in a traditional way if, if the storefronts are, are spread out. Um, uh, it's it's going to you're not going to get your products in 15 to 20 minutes if you. Uh, you know, in a, in a state with further distances, but it may help um, provide access if you, you know, reserve ahead or, or something like that along those lines. Chris, did I, did I see you raise your hand uh, physically in there, or am I seeing things? No, I do. Uh, I am, I guess I'm just seeing things. Um, so, we, um, I, I don't know if we want to open it up for, for a, a very brief discussion on, on whether we think that's something that should be delayed, whether it's something that the other, uh, other members think we should we should recommend moving forward with sooner rather than later, or uh, just kind of open to suggestions on that one. Dan. I like the idea of delivery personally, but I think it should be tied into farmer. I think it should be something available to the small scale operator that's growing, um, and not to others. That's my opinion. I, I would disagree with that respectfully. Um, I think if we're allowing delivery, uh, look, I, I spent years advocating with a small guy in Vermont, especially in the alcohol space, but there is also a sense of fairness. You know, if, we're, if we're advocating for delivery, I think we should allow delivery, you know, so whether it's a dedicated license or it's tied to the other types of retailers that do it, um, you know, I, I don't know that we should be um, only allowing certain types of growers to do it. Um, I, I would also add a different caveat um, to my earlier comment that I, I prefer waiting on delivery and events, you know, for the board wait on those till later years. I would take a strong exception to that um, for when uh, the uh, dispensaries roll under the authority of the board. And if the board were considering delivery for dispensaries sooner, I would strongly support that because, you know, access is a very different issue when you're talking about medical needs. Dan, can I just, this is James Pepper, can I just weigh in very briefly that we as a board have, have to make a recommendation whether to allow delivery. So I would like to hear the subcommittee talk about it and think about the potential, how it could look and, and what the fee structure might look like because we have to tell the legislature um, one way or the other. Um, we could just say no, but uh, to me it would be much more 
fruitful to give an actual recommendation to them uh, about this. So, and that, that goes with the special events permit as well. And, and just one point of clarification is that we do, the dispensaries currently medical are allowed to deliver to their patients. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, um, we can pause and talk about it a little bit now. We also um, can try to reserve some time at a future meeting if we want to get further into it. I, I think, Chris, I think you're the only uh, subcommittee member that we haven't haven't heard from. Do you have any thoughts on, on delivery, in, initial thoughts? And we can, we can kind of parse them up further. I think with all the social equity considerations, um, it's a opportunity for somebody to get into cannabis with you know a, a low barrier of investment compared to some of the other licenses yeah definitely we've seen that um obviously massachusetts uh limited the the delivery licenses to social equity i don't know if the social equity uh subcommittee group has, has thought of it I, hopefully they they have but that definitely is a a possibility uh Sivan? Uh, yeah, I would just add that one possibility um, to James's question um, is to make delivery uh, a checkbox addition to the other license types. You know, you're going to be a traditional storefront retailer and your fee is X, but also you're going to pay the extra, mm, whatever it is, a year to have delivery option. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that only people who have storefronts with other types of licenses can get delivery. You could potentially now, really, you could say what you're calling here non storefront delivery would be non storefront delivery, and all the other ones that have storefronts could also have a delivery option. Um, but I would certainly advocate uh, that if we're going to allow true non storefront delivery, i.e., a place that never has a storefront, that they still need some space that stores their stuff that meets certain uh, rules and regulations and, and probably isn't just a closet in their house. So, we're going to think about that a lot from a security standpoint. Um, but I, I do still, you know, just state for the record, my recommendation is that we allow delivery, but that it's delayed by a year or two to let other things come up. I'm fully fine if others disagree with that. But my recommendation would be to say, legislature, we, we do support delivery, but not starting it until whatever it is, year two or year three, so that we know the other things have, have, have really settled down. Um, so we, uh, we kind of have a lot of, delivery themes uh, or delivery threads here to, to tease out. Um, so I, I haven't, I don't think I can pull it to, to a full uh, recommendation here, but so there's kind of different ways that we could, uh, so we could, we've talked about delivering direct from, from a storefront, we've talked about delivering. I would imagine, uh, Sivan, as we put this all together, I would imagine that the delivery would have to come from somebody who has uh, either a wholesale license or has uh, another license to, to store products. Um, you know, cultivators could like it could. We could define whether it has to go from a product manufacturer or a cultivator, or if it has to go through a wholesaler. Like there, or by we, I mean the board can uh, can can define. But um, there's kind of different ways that we could structure that. I think some of the um, uh, the lowest barrier to entry for for social equity uh, licenses would be um, kind of that uh, courier model where they would deliver from. Um, storefronts to to customers uh, that could be I think uh, and Andrew uh, or Jen could pop in if that's uh, if they have some thoughts but um, some of the, the population uh, or the, the limited population and the distances in Vermont could make some of those uh, harder to make profitable straight from storefronts so that's why we're thinking from uh, maybe a wholesaler um, but again like you might need to have uh, I don't know how quickly the Vermont delivery entrepreneurs would be able to make these deliveries just from um, the, the distances that need to be carried, covered, and things along those lines. It's a little bit, it's, it'd be easier to do deliveries from a storefront around Burlington where most of your population is like near enough by that you can get there quickly. But um, so I think uh, generally, I think we might need to have some more time to. Um, talk about uh, delivery on a, on a future call or um, try to present a couple of different options um, to see if everyone uh, can get on board. Um, Stephanie? Uh, did you say that there would be a courier service? So you're talking about another industry that would serve as delivering from storefronts? I, 
the, the courier, kind of like courier model, um, like I guess like uh, Uber Eats for, uh, for cannabis delivery is one of the is one of the models of delivery that's been used in other states. Um, Massachusetts has both uh, like the courier model and then a model where you can deliver from non-storefront from uh, like from wholesale. Um, you know, one the lowest barrier to entry is, is, tends to be the the courier model because you don't really you don't need a whole lot other than uh, a via, a vehicle with the necessary security requirements um, and some and some technology to. to to get the orders and deliver the orders, but um, it's also some of the hardest ones to make profitable, um, just due to because there's just not a huge margin on um, if the like if you have to pay the uh, there's just not a huge margin on it since the money's mostly going to the uh, the retail outlet and not to the delivery driver. Um, so I think uh, we're quickly moving through time. So I think uh, if it's all right everyone here we'll try to reserve some time to, to talk about delivery um, in one of the upcoming meetings and probably on uh, temporary sales at events I think both of those are probably juicy topics where we could spend some time on it um, they're both probably related somewhat to some of the thoughts from other subcommittees um, and and uh, both we're not particularly close to a recommendation uh, right now so um, we'll move on in a second uh, Gina I see you have your hand raised so I just wanted to say that we will be discussing um, delivery for social equity candidates in the social equity subcommittee, but we haven't done so yet. I can maybe um, take a feel about it for now to get you um, just to see how the subcommittee feels about that. Great. Yeah, I think I think that could be helpful. I think a couple of these are going to be things that um, you know the subcommittee on, on social equity are, are obviously going to inform. Um, uh, what, what we do here and, and vice versa. So um, keep us posted on how those uh, conversations go. Um, so we have very quickly ran out of time, um, but uh, the one other big thing I guess I wanted to talk about, and maybe some of this will have to be kicked to another meeting too, but uh, for manufacturing, product manufacturing licenses, uh, to quickly go through the concept we were thinking, this doesn't, the board isn't required to tier this. Um, but we thought it might make sense to uh, to tier it uh, at least with kind of two different tiers, maybe three, depending on how some of the definitions of uh, cultivation are, are um, or the rules of cultivation are set by the board. Um, but our, our thought was basically at least a two-part uh, manufacturer's license. The first one um, would basically be the full license where you can um, uh, where you can have solvent-based extraction, uh, make all sorts of products. Um, they, no limits, like whatever you can do under the product manufacturing license, you could do with that license, and it would have um, kind of the higher fee out of the out of the manufacturing license. Uh, the second one, we thought it would be nice to make a lower fee manufacturing license where you weren't allowed to to use solvent-based extraction. So it would be made, mainly focused at uh, folks that want to make like infused products or or other um, uh, products for retail sales, but but will not be Kind of using the uh, the chemical process uh, that uh, that would require additional um, kind of security and, and public safety uh, measures. Um, so that we thought that could be a more approachable license at a more approachable fee for somebody who wants to come up with their own brand of um, you know infused product uh, X or whatever. Um, so could have had a longer explanation, but trying to move very quickly. Any any questions or thoughts on on that concept? I have a question. A couple. Yeah, Chris Walsh here. Um, so on the second license, I understand it's less expensive because you're now doing uh, solvent-based extractions, but couldn't the second tier license, couldn't you still purchase solvent-based extractions from wholesale? Yeah, so you could purchase uh, the um, you know, you could purchase the, the concentrate to infuse into the product. So again, we have to work through like, how, there might also be some, we might want to limit that further to um, if we're going to reduce the license fee um, so that, uh, you know, again, our goal is to make sure that all, every license that we recommend is economically viable and makes sense uh, uh, from a fee standpoint. So, um, uh, so you'd be able to purchase the product made by the 
tier one, for lack of a better term, uh, product manufacturer, and then you could use it to um, to do whatever you know, um, make your uh, make your whatever product. But not um, a not a product, the actual ingredient, right? I'm just trying to get clarity here. You with the second tier, less expensive license, wouldn't be able to manufacture. Um, solvent-based extraction, but you could purchase that ingredient from a wholesaler to use in your products. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, this is confusing. Yeah, all right. It was a very confusing explanation by me. I apologize. Um, any, uh, any other thoughts or, or questions on that? I see one. I think I see one approval. Any any other uh, approval of the concept? We can we can flesh it out further. Two. Great. Um, so uh, and then the last thing that we were going to um, was we were wondering if it kind of fits into our previous conversation about whether or not um, uh, farm if we do have a farmer limited license. Uh, whether cultivation would allow them to do some like limited processing there so that they could um, you know make pre-rolls or things along those lines I think we can kick that to we can probably assume that in that other conversation um, about uh, the, the farmer uh, license it could either be a separate tier of manufacturing license or it could just be something that that license is allowed to do under the under the rules of the board so um, since we have used up almost all of our time, I want to remit, uh, make sure that we have at least a few minutes for, for public comments. Um, so uh, we'll probably skip this last slide, which is um, about the other licenses. We'll, we'll hold that for, for another time. I think our recommendation was mostly just going to be, we don't think there's tiers needed in any of the other types of licenses. The wholesale licenses and testing lab licenses should probably have a relatively low fee. Um, and that um, when we're coming up with the integrated license fee, we just want to make sure that we um, account for the fact that there is already a $50,000 statutory fee um, put on top of them. But we'll um, just get that to a, to an, another call. Stephanie? I was wondering if there would be a cooperative license um, that might encompass any number of these tiers. And so we have, um, <laughs> we have not yet uh, talked about putting in a uh, co-op license cause, because I know the social equity um, subcommittee has been looking at it. Uh, so again, like, again, it's kind of the interplay between the, between the subcommittees. We were going to, we were waiting to see what, like, I, we've been, I think, envisioning kind of like the basic framework here. Um, and then as other subcommittees kind of recommend um, license types, trying to incorporate them into the framework. So I'm not sure if that was the, the trying to, a lot of things going on at once, so we're trying to trying to figure out how to how to work together. But that was our our concept. Um, so we're happy to hear from um, Gino or the um, social equity subcommittee on on their idea for for a co-op and um, try to try to fit it in and, and make sure it works. Um, but, but that's that's why it's not here. I guess is the answer. Okay. Thank uh, you. Yeah. And 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 in the subcommittee, we should be getting to all of that um, information next week. Um, right now we're just um, finalizing who, um, what is the social equity candidate um, for blood loss and criteria around that. Thank you. Um, so then I, that's kind of it. Um, again, we'll have stuff for next call uh, as follow up, but um, do we have any public comments? Uh, so we, we've got two, two members of the public here in the room that want to make a public comment. So if you want to just say your name. Hello, my name is Bernardo Silva. I'm legislative director at Vermont Growers Association. I just have one question regarding uh, the subject that was just discussed, which was licensing and separation of solventless and hydrocarbon. Um, in Vermont statutes, Title 18 Health, Chapter 84, Possession and Control of Regulated Drugs, Subchapter 01, Section 423, 4230H. That's 4230H, chemical extraction via butane or hexane prohibited. Section A, no person shall manufacture concentrated cannabis by chemical extraction or chemical synthesis using butane or hexane unless authorized as a dispensary pursuant to registration issued by the Department of Public Safety pursuant to chapter 86 of this title. So my question is um, with regard to licensing and creating a two-tier processing license 
would the three dispensaries under this regula under this law be the only ones allowed to attain that licensing? And has the subcommittee had any discussions in terms of recommendations for the CCB or the legislature in amending that uh, law to allow for chemical extraction to be uh, <clears throat> processed by um, all producers and not just the vertically integrated license holders? Um, I. Uh, just a brief answer. I, I will say that I uh, I anticipated that uh, the recommendations of this subgroup would be that uh, that those licenses would not be limited just to the uh, to, to the um, existing licenses, and that it would be open to anyone applying to, to enter the adult use market for that license type. Um, but I haven't. I don't think we've had a discussion about it yet with the um, with the rest of the group. But I, I think that's uh, where where my head is at, yeah. where I support it, and where the group is. Yeah. You know, in addition to that, we can, we can review the statute and obviously this will be a, um, a decision that the council for uh, the kind of control board will, will make. But um, many, many of the, um, uh, you know, bait pens and other concentrated products are, are made with compressed CO2, which, you know, from, from your reading of that may not necessarily be prohibited. Well, um, just to follow up with the vape cartridges, and I guess. Um, has the subcommittee had any discussion about the, the fact that the law only allows for the dispensing of oils in vape cartridges and, you know, other, how that impacts other parts of the industry such as public health, uh, waste, uh, environmental sustainability, uh, child safety, and these kind of things. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, my opinion as a consumer and former producer that it's wholly irresponsible for the the, part, the state of Vermont to require that oil ca that cartridge is the only method of consumption for concentrates, and that's what's there right now. You know, we, we talked about. I mean, this committee discussed uh, different levels of cult of uh, processing. You know, solventless processing is basically thrown out the window when you only have cartridges, and uh, that's the one with that's the method of processing with the lowest barrier of entry. You know something uh, Chris here mentioned but, as being beneficial. We're over so, time. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you for your comment. Okay. That's actually the only public comment in the room right now. So um, we can uh, we can move to adjourn. All right. Um, sounds good. Thanks everyone for uh, joining us. Do I have a, a motion to adjourn? So moved. The uh, first. Stephanie seconding. Uh, I think we are adjourned. Um, thanks, everyone. I will. Um, we'll be meeting again.